Hey friends, welcome. It's that time again for another moment with Miranda. I'm so glad that you are joining me for this moment um, and just to share in all of the goodness of God. You know, welcome, welcome to the Father's table. Why don't you go ahead and pull up a chair? There's a place for you here. There's a spot with your name on it right there at God's table and he's saying come and sit for a while I've got something prepared for you I even know what you like um, I I know your name and I know all of your preferences and he's saying just come and sit and be with me for a while you know I've been basking in the goodness of God this week just how eternal he is and yet also how personal he is um, I was reliving again that that moment in the desert in Yuma where God showed me his love through a head of lettuce and I saw a picture that came up on my Instagram and it just reminded me again because on that little head of lettuce the brand on the head of lettuce was called dandy and it made me laugh because of how personal God is you know my my dad had several nicknames for me as a kid but one of the things that he would always call me was dandy Mirandy. and when I saw that on the head of lettuce again this week I thought God that is just like you that you even know my nickname you know I like lettuce and you know that dad my earthly dad always called me dandy mirandy and there was that lettuce with dandy on it and it just made me smile again friends that's how personal god is he's not some being up in the sky that we can't know he dwells within our hearts by faith and he calls our name and like I said, he invites us to his table. So welcome to the Father's table. Welcome to this week's moment with Miranda. I pray that you're blessed by it. Tonight I want to talk for just a few minutes about reference point. A reference point. See, all of my life I've been pretty good at directions. Um, I'm not one of those kind of people that you could say she'd get lost in a paper bag. That's that's not me at all. I don't typically have to take the time to see what aisle I'm in at Walmart whenever I park my car. Uh, I'm not someone who easily loses their way as, as far as directions go and doesn't know where I am. If I've been somewhere before, most of the time I can find my way back to it again. That's one of the little characteristics I got from my dad. Um, he has always been directional. But maybe if I've not even been to a place, if I have a map and I can find myself on that map, then and see where I want to go, then typically I can end up there. So I'm not afraid to go places on my own um, or to try things you know that I've not necessarily done before. But I've also found that much of my security in getting to where I want to go lies in being assured that I've already been that way or that I have some kind of a reference point from which to launch out from or to know that I'm actually on the right track because I want to know I'm going the right way. I mean, come on, friends. How long have we been sharing these moments together? You know I'm the kind of person that likes to do it right. God forbid if I should get lost and go the wrong direction. And the, this is how I would give directions to someone. I tend to be a landmark person. I would say, when you come to the Walmart, go right. And then you're going to drive for about a block and turn left at that place where we had the really good chicken that one time. And then go on for maybe a few more miles. And whenever you come to that place where we had the tires change that time after the blowout, that's where it's going to be at on the right hand side. You know, I'm, I'm a landmark direction giver. Or then there's people that they give directions like this. They say go west for half a block and then turn north and then your destination is going to be on the east side. And I'm like, uh, I have no idea what you just said. The only way that I can follow those kind of directions is to actually get out a physical map, 
find where I am on that map. And sometimes that takes me even turning the map or my body to get my reference point and then launching out from there. You know, regardless, whether it's by a landmark or a map, I like to know that I'm on the right track because I can recognize places that I've been before. I like to know where I am on the map even. This gives me assurance and security and confidence that even if the destination is a place that I've never been, at least I have a reference point. And that gives me a little bit of sense of a, oh, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get there. And that makes sense. I mean, that, that's, that's good. And truthfully, much of our Christian walk, if we could equate the two together, much of our Christian walk is one that is walked out from points of reference. We saw God move here. We knew he worked there. We did this and he did that. And, and many times we go back to what we know because there's this sense of security there. I know God was there. I know that worked. I know he said that because I can see in retrospect how it turned out well for me. Again, it makes sense to go back to where you knew something to be true. We build our house of faith on blocks of remembrance. We remember the things that God has done, knowing that what he did before, that he'll do it again, that he remains the same, that he's faithful. And again, this is good, but there's also this subtle danger that if I'm not mindful of, I can begin to worship what I've built through my own experiences over the God of the experience. I can make it about what has been done. Even the good things, they're, they're good rather than the God that did those things or the, his nature that inspired those good things to be done on his behalf. And friends, this can become a stumbling block to us because we can begin to measure everything that God will do off of what he's already done. And where does that leave you and I when what God is doing now is something that's never been done before? Or it looks different than how we anticipated that it was actually going to look. What happens when God asks us to trust him for which, in a place for which we have no reference point at all? Do we move by faith into what we don't know, trusting that as we follow what he's saying, we'll get to where he intends us to be? Or, or do we get so confined and stay stuck in our past that we don't move forward? We're afraid because this doesn't look like how I thought. I've got no reference point for where I am right now. And if we were to look in the book of Exodus, we read the story of how God is delivering the children of Israel out of the Egyptian bondage. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, God says, it's time. It's time for you to let his people go. It's time for there to be deliverance. And instead of agreeing wholeheartedly in Moses or in Pharaoh saying, great, they've served me well, go on. Instead, the Bible tells us that he increases the load on the children of Israel that he makes an even greater demand on their work, that he adds more labor with less material. And it just seems so funny to me that it's right at the time when God says, okay, it's time for there to be a release and time for there to be freedom, that things get worse. The everything that is anti-God begins to increase the burden, the weight, the work, the struggle. And Moses comes to God and he's basically saying like, God, what is up with what's happening right now? You know, I thought you said this is freedom time. Did you lie or, or did I miss it? Did I hear it wrong? And God, I love God because he says to Moses, he says, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. But it's not going to be in a way that you have experienced it before. In other words, there is no reference point for what I'm about to do for you. There's no reference point to the place that I'm about to bring you to. You must simply believe. 
You must trust not only my word that I will make it good, but also my nature that I am good. And in Exodus chapter 6 verse 2, we read, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Now, when this is translated into English, it's translated just how I said it. God says, I am the Lord. But in Hebrew, it literally says, when God spoke to Moses, as if God was standing right there, he literally said, Jehovah. He said his name. That's all that he said. And friends, I think it's important that we pay attention to this because the first thing that God declares over where Israel is, a place that they have never experienced before, the first thing that he declares and make known is his name, Jehovah. Friends, his name is his nature. His name is his authority. His name is his renown. Uh, God's name is the revelation of himself to the world. It's his dominion. By signing his name, he's declaring all that he is, all that he presently is. And not only that, that where he is, everything that is needed also is there. His nature, his authority, his dominion, his power, his might, that comes along with his name. And by giving his name as like a banner, a headline over the situation that they were finding themselves in, he was establishing for the children of Israel in that present time a reference point from which they were going to be able to walk forward and to move forward by faith and in victory. And it's amazing what he then says next, because he tells them that your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these, these patriarchs by which you saw their lives and you've walked from their experience, he says that they knew me by my name, God Almighty. El Shaddai is how it says in Hebrew. They had an experience with the nature of God. He was all sufficient. He had provided for them. They lived in that place. They believed from that place. They saw God move from that place. It was good. It was faith. It was the patriarch's experience with God. But God said that although they knew me by my name, God Almighty, by Al Shaddai, they have not experienced me. They did not experience me by my name, Jehovah. That is the eternal, the self-existent, the unchanging I am that I am God. This was not making little of all that God was to them. It wasn't making light of their experience. It wasn't saying that it wasn't enough or that it wasn't sufficient. He said that he was El Shaddai, all sufficient. It was enough for them. It was his promise. They believed it. They lived it. And they embraced everything that he said. And even the generation that was experiencing the bondage of Egypt in that present moment, they heard about this God Almighty, this El Shaddai. They lived in the knowledge that there was a land that this God had had said was theirs that they hadn't yet come to. Their reference point up until then was God's faithfulness to the past. It was his faithfulness to their forefathers, to the ones that had gone before them. But I have to wonder if every time they made a brick, Every time they mixed that straw in the clay, you know, did they ask, when, God, when will we see the land that you promised? When will you deliver us? You know, they seem to never get to where they promised that they would go. Think about it. There was 400 years that passed from when God made the promise to Abraham to the time when deliverance was actually going to happen for them. That's a long time to believe. But you see, friends, God was about to do something for Israel, but they were going to have to trust him in a new 
new way. God was establishing for them a new point of reference from which they were going to have to believe. And it would be a personal experience with Jehovah, the self-existent, the almighty, the unchanging, I am that I am. And this is what he said. He said, I have heard you. I've heard your groaning. I've heard your cry. I remember my promise that I made to your fathers. And I am about to do this thing for you. The very word that I promised. He was not only declaring that he was eternal, that he was the God of the patriarchs, but he was also making known and declaring that he was personal to them themselves. This is so awesome, friends, because I've been experiencing this myself in my life. I mean, I've had experiences before in the past, but this year, it's like the God have, of heaven has said to me personally, you, Miranda, you, Dandy Mirandi, it's that personal that he would speak to me and he has just stamped a reference point on my life so that now I have this experience with God from which I can begin to move and to walk and to work from. And it's giving me this greater urgency to believe for the future place, for my next season, for what God is bringing me into personally. But friends, this challenges me and it challenges, I believe, all of us as believers and as the church that we can be guilty of making a measure out of our own experiences with God by which we measure other people and we force other people to live up to and abide by and we can judge the legitimacy of their experience with God and what God is doing in them presently because it doesn't look like our reference point. Because it doesn't look like how we experience him or how we say that things have to be. Their bricks don't look like our bricks. That's not how God did things in my day. You know, that can't be God because we've not seen him move that way. Or I don't believe that he works that way. And when you and I force other people to live in the way that God has worked for us or his plan in us, we are in essence trying to make ourselves God for that person. And we try what it is that he wants to do. We are actually making him small. And if you and I are not careful, we can effectively stifle and cut off the life flow of a generation by demanding that they live in a place in the stream of our own flow rather than in the flow that God is establishing for them. And when we can find them and when we make them small and say, this is how it must be. This is how God works. This is what you must do. This is how he speaks. This is where you must go next. We place restrictions that they were never created to have on themselves. And we can squeeze the new life of God out of them that he wants to do and he wants to give simply because we personally don't have a reference point for that place from which they are believing God to do something greater. That really is a sobering thought to me, friends. But you see, like, there are always going to be times in the walk of every believer where we experience this type place where we are pressed beyond measure. Even the Apostle Paul said that we're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We need to take notice that there's a difference between being in a tight place that God leads us to or one that is forced on us by man. You see, in the natural, when I think about a strait, a strait is a narrow body of water that leads from a sea to a larger ocean. 
at the Strait of Gibraltar. I've actually been to the Rock of Gibraltar and seen the Strait where the Strait of Gibraltar leads the it it unites the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. And this is how God works. You see, God's tight places are intended to move us from one sea to an ocean. They move us from life to life, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. It's an ever increasing flow from one body of water to another. But the tight places that are inflicted or forced on us by man force us into a mold or into a measure and they never move from life to life instead they don't move at all they simply stagnate and they end up bringing forth life they create they they lead to or not life they bring death they lead to death they can lead to death for the next generation if you and I insist on others living from our own experience. Friends, that's not what God intends for you and I. That's not what God intends for the life that he wants you and I to display. You know, how do you and I recognize and determine the work of God in a life? I think that we have to ask ourselves is this bringing life? Today, are we looking to increase life or just hold on to the things for which we have a reference point? The things for which we find comfort and security in. You see, friends, in this moment, I believe that as the body of Christ, the church in this hour, we have found ourselves in this place of no reference point. It's a place that we've not been here before. There are no landmarks to say, turn right here. Where's the McDonald's to where I got the hamburger before? So I know that that's where I turn right. You know, where's the map? There's not even a map that I can find my place on the map to be able to walk walk to where I'm going. This is not a place that any of our experience has found ourselves in. And the truth is, is that we don't have to like it. We don't even have to agree with it, but it is here. It's here whether we like it or not. And friends, this is what I believe and what I hear the spirit of the Lord saying. I hear him saying to me, these words, Miranda, I am. I hear him saying to the body of believers in the United States of America, American church, I am. I hear him saying to the body of believers, the worldwide, worldwide body of Christ, I am. Am. He is establishing a reference point for you and I in these days for which we have no reference. He's establishing himself that the God of now, the God today is I am. Yes, he's the God of the past experience, but he is also the God of now. He is our reference point today. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, Wherefore, seeing that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He says, looking unto Jesus, that is present. It's a present accent. It's a present active verb. It's something that you and I do. The present I am, the one who is right now. He's the author. He's the one who was, and he's also the finisher, the one who will be. But friends, tonight, he is our reference point. Let us look up 
not just for deliverance, not just for our ticket out of here, getting out of this place, out of this present darkness, but rather, friends, let us look up for the instruction. Let us look up for the direction to the I am who is willing to declare and make known himself to this generation, through this generation, in our time, in our day. Friends, this is what you and I have been believing for. This is what we have said would be. Do I know if Jesus is coming back any moment? I have no idea. But friends, church, this is the moment of our lives. And will you and I embrace what he is presently doing? Or will we get stuck in the bondage? Will we get stuck in the season that we're in? Will we get stuck in the past experience? I say no. I say let us look unto Jesus, the I am, his unchangeable nature, and let us trust and believe and know that he is good, that he is faithful, and let us get into the flow of the present, the I am, because church, friends, everywhere the river of life flows, there is life. Everywhere the river flows, there is life. There is a broad and a wide place for you and I to come to and to receive from in Christ. So let's do it tonight. Let's get in the river and let's work and let's believe from the reference place of the I am of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, I thank you that you are eternal, that you are unchanging. And I thank you, Lord, that you are personal that you are high and you are lifted and that you are above it all and in it all and through it all and to it all, but you are close. That you are as close and as personal as my breath. You're as personal as knowing my name, as knowing the things that I love and that bring me pleasure and that will let me know that you know me. Father, thank you that these are the reference points of my life, Lord. We see ourselves day to day in these places where things don't look familiar, where we don't even know sometimes it feels like where we're going. But Father, may we find our reference point in you, that you know that you are the I am and that you are leading us into the fullness, that you're not leading us into stagnation. May we recognize the places of death in our lives and refuse to stay there. But rather, Lord, would we allow that tight space that we have found ourselves in to be a place that propels us into the greatest place that we've ever been, into the largeness that you have intended. Father, forgive us for our eyes being so small. May we lift our eyes and look to you, the great I am, as our reference point in this time, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me again for another moment with Miranda, for taking your place at the Father's table and hearing what he would say. May these words be words of life. May they speak truth. May they ignite a passion. May you, may you leave tonight burning with a greater desire to know the I am and to walk in the fullness of who he is exposing and showing himself to be for us in these days. In Jesus' name, friends, as always, remember that God loves you so very much, and so do I. I hope that you'll join me next time for another moment with Miranda. God bless you all.